OSG, OSG, change the game. Come together, bringing leaders, we don't play. Make a difference, being different, switching lanes. OSG, OSG, change the game. Annual toy giveaway. Come on, Michelle, let us know what's happening. Well, this um, well, it started 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, I seen a kid with no coat. Um, I asked all my friends, let's buy coats. So total, we end up with 100 coats. We gave the 100 coats away. The next year, I wanted to do 200. So I said, you know what, I'll do 100 myself and everybody else do 100. And then, I mean, every year it elevated to, um, to something else. And last year, surprisingly, um, I have a good friend named Adam. Oh, I own a couple of stores, and he's the management. So, I, I mean, he said, Michelle, you know what? I want this to be the best one you ever had. This is your 10-year anniversary. I want this to be your best one. So, he said, so we target the shelter systems and um, anything that, you know, I mean, we I do a lot of wish lists on the less fortunate. But it's being that the gifts are so nice, it's getting populated with some people who shouldn't be on the line. But um, technically, we it'd be, if the goal was to target the um, children in need, we got another we got another children's book. Michelle saves Christmas. Go ahead, Michelle. Go ahead, Queen. Talk to us. Talk to <laughs> us, Michelle. Well, basically, it was really because of you. I would have never done a children's book. It was definitely because of you. And um, secondly. I've read numerous um, children's books and it's always fictional. It's not the reality of struggling kids and kids in poverty. So I wanted to change that narrative because I don't want you to think that you had to be coming from a special home or you had to be rich or had certain things to receive Christmas. No, I mean, Christmas is for kids in poverty as well. And they come out with good outcomes just like a kid that don't live in poverty. Do. Can you tell people the significance of 1212? and why you feel like this was the best day to release your book? Okay, um, 1212 is my grandmother's birthday. Um, my grandmother had 13 kids and she all, I mean, and all her children had children. And um, during the crack ep epidemic, all her children were on drugs. So she took care of all her kids, her children's children. So um, we all lived in one household and she only got a social security check. So she made sure she took care of all of us on her social security check. And we would have friends come over. And although she didn't have nothing, she made sure everybody ate, everybody, you know, she did the best with what she had. And she made it stretch. So she taught me, I mean, you know, the give back. She, she taught me, I mean, humility. She taught me humbleness. So I wanted to dedicate the book to her because that's what it's about. It's about giving. Would you want to talk, you want to talk about them all day? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adapt them up. I'm launching what's called Adapt, not an app. It's the centralized application, and it's on Web3. And it's the first one of its kind where I can showcase in the Web3 world and that space what you could do in movies, music, art, metaverse, magazines, all of it in that space and how it gets paid, the transparency of it. I'm just going to showcase what I'm working on currently. And this is a community and adapt where all of us can eat. And I'll be showcasing that to y'all after I showcase it to the young ones first. Because at the end of the day, they are our future. They need to know exactly what the future needs because we need to work on it now. And they'll be just in the right adult. Like if they start now, I'm watching this kid. I'm like imagining because, you know, I'm a, tra a, a time traveler. What does this kid look like as a man? And he's doing man things. But when he has, when he's 10 years from now, what is it going to look like? And I see chairman, I see entertainer personality, and I also see billionaire. And I also see all the people that he's teaching as adults, as billionaires, and starting a new algorithm for us. What it looks like when we teach us what we need to be independent, not dependent. And it starts with these kids. So to me, the world's going in this direction just because the transparency of the tracking on the blockchains. And I know it doesn't sound so familiar now when people don't understand it, but you tell somebody something 10 times, they'll start to get it. And y'all know that because you're all educators. Yes, sir. Wow. And my dad, my dad used to say this all the time. He said the Calvary ain't coming. Nobody is coming to help us. 
So if we're constantly waiting for somebody else to do it, we're going to be waiting forever. And so that's why Dream Hustle Co. was created, because we understood, look, in the black and brown community, if we were the last to get everything else, all the resources, all the funding to get everything else, how much more for technology? And so that's why we created this to be able to educate our own people in the technology, in the Web 3.0, as well as personal development, because at the end of the day, nobody is going to save us but ourselves. And so back to that point you made before, that's why it's important for all of us to come together, the Dream Hustle Codes, the OSGs working together to not only just impact each other, but it really reached back to the next generation because I'm 18, right? I'm still helping my generation, but what about the generation that's like five years old already programming things on their tablets and whatnot? How can we create now, what, a future What about them? Baby Dusko on the tablet? Yes, sir, on the tablet, already creating the future. What can we do to make sure his life is easier in the future so that he can go on and create the next Apples and next Googles on Web 3.0? And so that's why this event is super important. We have people like Mr. Dash as well as others talking to speak to the kids because at the end of the day, we need more examples. We need hope. And that's what this event is for, to give people hope again. Now, one of the things that I want people to understand is that the conversation about a, a student being a proficient reader doesn't always equate to them being proficient in assessment. And I think we got to be able to include both in the conversation about not necessarily thinking that because they read well and they comprehend well, that that means they're going to test well. Because there's other things that come in, involved in that. There is the whole stress level that comes into the play, come into play, the formatting that comes into play, the familiarity of the test. All of those things come into play. And so now there are people who were having this conversation some, some years ago, talking about balanced literacy and talking about everything else that did not talk about test prep and test supporting, supporting students for test prep that are now having that conversation. Mm -hmm. You and I discussed earlier, you yeah. think about you think about many of our communities that when we are talking about SAT prep, ACT prep, we're talking about regions prep, we're talking about college prep, all of these things people the pay bar. All, yeah, people pay all yeah. this money to, mm -hmm. to to be involved in, but yet and still we keep telling our students or keep telling the people who work with our students that test prep isn't important. But it's important to everybody else. So when we talk about being able to achieve a level of mastery or get to another place in education and now moving into their careers, many of our kids don't even have the opportunity to, to, to reach that level because they're failing tests as early as third grade all the way yeah. because we consistently hear this message, oh, don't teach to the test, don't teach to the test. My argument with people with that is in the, what should we do? We can't just continue to, uh, we just can't continue to negate the fact that there is some skills that are needed for our young people, not only in school, but in life in general. And everything moving forward for them in their career, Jacko, is going to be, is going to require them to have some kind of involvement in testing. I've had the luxury of having some phenomenal teachers, and I've turned around some of the most challenging schools in America. But you know what? I have never, as a principal, I have never, even in my position right now as chief, chief academic officer and chief of student service, I have never mention anything about a state assessment. Mm -hmm. And I have always, I have always, always had some of the highest gain scores and some of the top achievers. So what does that look like for you, Doc? What does that look like for you, Doc? Say again? What does that look like for you? In, well, in, in... Uh, well, a couple of things. Number one, first of all, I've always operated from the effective domain first. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lift the people up, especially the little people. That's where I start first. I think we've been um, bamboozled. We've been hoodwinked. Um, and even during the testing process, um, you kept referring back to third grade, third grade, third grade. Well, if you wait until third grade, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, our kids' academic foundation will be on quicksand if you wait that long. Um, so you have to get them in pre-K. You have to get them in kindergarten. And many of the kids at the schools that I've actually been involved in, um, that's where I've always started at. And literacy and reading has always been my top notch in, in our system that we're currently in right now. If you don't get that by second grade or third grade, you're drowning. You're, you're, I mean, you're literally drowning and you're never able to catch up. Um, so that has always been my thought process, um, teaching kids how to decode words. Um, determine the meaning of those words, read fluently the, the words that they're reading, comprehend that sentence that they just read fluently, and being able to 
write and speak about what they read fluently. Um, that has been my formula, and I've done that, and everything seems to always take care of its place. Welcome, Dr. Manuel. We love you, and Thank we appreciate you. you coming on. So what's going Thank on with you? you? Thank you. Thank you for having me. One of the things I wanted to say is that we have to give the kids confidence that they can do that. Yes. Because with the idea that you can, you will. So mm -hmm. you've got to start now building up their self-esteem. You can do this. I'm with you. I'm going to give you all the tools. Because, you know, when you have it in your head that you can do it, you can do it. So Absolutely. right now it's start giving them all that they need. You are great. You are powerful. You're going to ace this test. You're going to do that. Uh, so that's what I did. And, and, and Dr. Mendel, can I just add to that? Is that and then we don't have to wait until April or the day or the week of the test to do it. We start one. now. We start now. Day one. I start the first day of school. We are preparing you. And, and explain to them what tests are all about, that they're going to be taking tests the rest of their life. They have to learn how to ace these tests. And when they're confident, when they know that they can do it, they can. And then you also have to teach them about being hydrated, drinking water that day of the test. You have to teach them the test taking strategies. They need to go to bed, get some rest, all of those things, the deep breathing, how to relax yourself. You teach them all of those things so that when they go to that test, they are confident. They feel because, you know, when you know you can do something, you'll you'll do it. <laughs> you'll use Absolutely. every resource you have. Last thing, which I've been telling everybody is stay healthy, everybody. Your health is the most important thing. I said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, I'm retired and I'm in the, I'm in better health than I was before because I made sure that all through my time as principal, superintendent, all of those things, I worked on my health, went to the doctor, drank my water, did the things I needed to do. Without your health, when you retire, you, you don't have anything. You know, Absolutely. all the money in the world, all of that won't do you any good. The books that you've written, all of that, nothing will matter if your health isn't good. So if you don't listen to anything, I say, take that. I did 44 years um, in education. And uh, so I'm just giving you some of those wise uh, things that I've learned um, and, uh, you know, and to keep up the fight.